Traders, welcome to our special about the book of Exodus. So the goal here is, I'm thinking back on my atheist days of um, thinking that the Bible is just this really old book. It's not relevant today anymore. Things are different. Uh, we have uh, computers now, and therefore everything's, it's like, no, no, human nature is still the same. So the goal here is for us to understand the relevancy of the Bible and the particular books of the Bible, in this case, Exodus. Uh, and also, the, really, just to be honest, inspire you to read it and be curious. Be like, oh, that's interesting. I've never heard that before. I'm going to go read it and check that out myself, maybe for the first time, maybe for uh, a refresher. Um, excited for our next guest, Rabbi Pincus Taylor. He's a uh, founder of The Ark, which is a Hebrew Bible study program. It's like an official version of what, of what we're trying to put together here. Rabbi, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm grateful you're here. So uh, with Dennis Prager, we're going to talk more about the plagues. Uh, with Tom Askell, founder of the, the Founders Ministry, uh, we're going to talk more about the Ten Commandments. But I, I want to talk to you about the opening to the Ten Commandments, the often overlooked opening, first line, the, pre, the prefix, uh, the, the, the preface of the Ten Commandments. What does God say? So he says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And one of the interesting questions that's asked by the Jewish sages, the Hebrew sages, is why does God introduce himself as the God who took us out of the land of Egypt? Wouldn't it be more impressive to say something like, I'm the Lord your God who created the heavens and the earth. I created the universe. Like taking us out of Egypt, taking the Israelites out of Egypt seems like much smaller in comparison to creating the entire universe. So God introduces himself as the creator of, excuse me, God introduces himself as the one who took us out of the land of Egypt because he wants to demonstrate to us that he's a personal God. Being just the creator of the heavens and the earth, being the, the first cause, some sort of removed remote force that caused everything into being, that's nice. Right? The universe is a big place, but he's saying, I'm the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. I'm the God of history. I'm the God that's involved in mankind's deeds and my, mankind's uh, story. I'm the God that is yours. I'm personal. And one of the interesting things that you'll notice in the original Hebrew, so in Hebrew, there's uh, different conjugations and ways to say things that kind of get lost in the English translation. So in English, if you want to say your, either in the singular or the plural, I could say your talking to just you, or I could say your talking to a whole group of people, I still use the same word your. When it comes in Hebrew, what God says, even though the entire Israelite nation is standing at the mountain of Sinai, and God is now telling the entire nation together, I'm the Lord your God, when he says, Anoichi Hashem Aleichecha, I am the Lord your God, he doesn't say, I'm the Lord your God in the collective. He says, I'm the Lord your God, personal God, individual God. I'm the God of your life. I'm involved in your deeds. I care about what you do. That's a very powerful message. And I think sometimes something that gets lost in our modern understanding of God or the way that we think of God as sort of this removed figure, maybe an old man in the sky who every once in a while shoots lightning bolts down. And this is a very um, primitive view of God. The God that introduces himself in the Ten Commandments is a personal God, a God who cares very deeply about us and cares even more so what we do, how we live our lives. Rabbi, that is so stinking awesome. I can't even get like that. That is Unbelievable. And I, I love the message. I love going back to the original Greek and Hebrew because of things like that. And the English language is awful. <laughs> like the, the English language is so, it's so insufficient when you recognize uh, the, the Greek and the Hebrew. That is an incredible insight that is so lost. And I'm so grateful <laughs> that you just shared that. Um, let's talk about the Israelites and their grumbling. Right? That's what I always go back to. This is the biggest lesson of Exodus for me is, is they're whining and complaining all the time. And I think I'm so much better than that, Rabbi. I would never complain if I saw the Red Sea parted and rescued from slavery. And it's like, no, you fool. You complain just the same. Uh, right. Can you speak to that? What <laughs> lesson can we learn from them? 
I mean, the, the grumbling is, is something, unfortunately, that uh, comes with human nature. No matter how good God is to us, we'll always find something to grumble with. Uh, a person can be on the highest heights spiritually one day and be so inspired and so motivated to connect to God. And, and then just a few moments later or the next day, back to normal, back to your old self. Kind of like, you know, we, we just came into a new year around we February already, but a lot of people think of their New Year's resolution. You get all inspired. Okay, January 1st is coming and I got to make amends in my life and I'm going to reconnect. I'm going to start going to house of worship. I'm going to join the gym, whatever it is. And we're inspired, we're passionate, and then the next day comes, or a week later comes, and eh, back to normal. So God can gift us the gift of life. God can gift us the gift of health and of children and all sorts of wonderful things in our lives. And then we're just like, oh, God, why is all this happening to me? So we're grumblers. Unfortunately, we're grumblers. No matter how good God is to us, we go back to our human self. And that's part of the battle of being a human being is grappling within and recognizing that, hey, there's, there's something bigger, something more cosmic that I should be involved with. This may tie in to Exodus 33, 23. You will see my back, but you will not see my face. Give us the, the context to that line from God. What does that mean? So th this is an interesting passage. Um, so God... Uh, after the, the Israelites received the Torah at Mount Sinai. So just 40 days later, they're already worshiping the golden calf. Moses went up, to, went up on the mountain. He's getting all of the details of the law. And the Israelites miscalculate. Oh, he's not coming back. And they decide, you know what? We're gonna, we need a new Moses. We need, some, we need a replacement figure. And so they build this golden calf. Moses then comes down from the mountain. He destroys the, the tablets that were given by God. And then Moses goes back up on the mountain uh, a bit later to beseech God for forgiveness, that God should forgive them. Please forgive them for their terrible sin of worshiping this calf. And as God, for lack of a better term, is coming around and, and proceeds to forgive them, Moses sees that there's an opportune time now. Hey, maybe I can ask God a bigger question. Some, I, maybe I can present God with something, a question that since he's kind of in a good mood, again, for lack of a better term, God doesn't have moods, but he's things are going well. Why don't I ask him something? And God, he asks God, show me your glory. Show me the full picture of God. I don't want to be limited to my human perspective anymore. Tell me how you work. I want to see the full glory. And God tells them that this is not something that a human being can understand. I can reveal myself to you, but you're not going to see my face. You're going to see my back. You're going to see behind me. And there's two practical meanings that we can learn from that. Oftentimes in our lives, the, the times where we see God clearest is from the back. Meaning that when we're going through something, when we suffer that job loss or other uh, trials and tribulations in our life, when we go through it, the moment we go through it, we're, we feel like the end of the world is here, my life is over, all of these different things. But sometimes we're privy that when we look back on it, we see, oh my gosh, there was a divine hand in my life. God has brought me to the right place. I'm exactly where I need to be. And were it not for that event happening that I was so hung up on, I wouldn't have been brought here. We see it time and again. I, I, can't ima I can't even describe to you how many people over the years, when I'm sitting with them as they're going through the trial, it's the end of the world. But then a year later, five, ten years later, they look back, oh my gosh, my life has been so blessed because of that event. Now, uh, there's, there's another short insight that I'd like to share with you because th this yeah. is something very relevant to our lives where God tells us, I can't show you the, the front. I can't show you the, my face. I can't show you my essence. I can only show you the back. You know, one of the beliefs that we have as a, as a believing person is that we, we're limited. We, we live in a physical world. We have limited views and we, we only can tap into where our five senses can process. But ultimately, at, in the afterlife, we will have clarity. We will have an understanding of what this whole world was all about, why each event happened, how it all lines up. We'll see it very clearly, very perfectly.
And so when I think of this verse, I'm always brought back to a needlepoint picture that I used to see in my great grandmother's house. Now they're not popular anymore, but in my great grandmother's house, there was this beautiful piece of art that was made from needlepoint. And in the picture, when you walk in the door, there was this, there were mountains and trees and everything looked beautiful. That was the front. But if you take that needlepoint picture, and you take it off the wall and you're holding it in front of you and you are standing on the other side. So I'm looking at it from the front view. You're looking at it from the back view. You ever see the back view of, of one of those uh, needlepoint pictures? It's all chaotic, crisscross, doesn't make any sense, all, flowing all over the place. It looks like, a, like spaghetti. It's just all over the place. But you turn it around, you look at it from the front, you see, ah, beauty is perfect. And so this is our vantage point in our world, in a, in a physical world, and the vantage point in God's uh, view, and, and something that we maybe are privy to only uh, when we are finished our allotted time in this world, when we can see the front view. Right now, when I can only see the back view, I'm look, looking at the back of the needlepoint picture. And when I see all the events that happen in my life, my, the, the events that happen to me, the events that happen to the world, I see spaghetti, it doesn't seem to make any sense. It's all chaotic. One thing doesn't seem to fit with the other. There's no cause and effect, no rhyme and reason. But little do I know that if I could see it from the front view, I'll see that everything is perfect. And right. so this is what God is telling us. You can only see my back right now. And if things aren't so great right now, don't seem like everything is so great, don't worry. From the front view, I got this. I'm your God. Everything's just the way that it needs to be. Hmm. Beautiful. Uh, Rabbi, let's do it again, sir. I'm in. Count me in. Rabbi Pincus Taylor. Tremendous, sir. Have a wonderful day. If you enjoyed that, that was just a taste of what we have to come this Friday, 3 o'clock Eastern. We're going to be talking to the great Dennis Prager and also Tom Askell from Founders Ministry. We'll talk in more detail, greater detail about the plagues, and we'll go over the Ten Commandments. That's all coming up this Friday, 3 o'clock. If you missed it, then don't worry. You can download the app for free on your smartphone and watch it there.